Teardown time. This is a old uh, digital watch. It has the analog face, so uh, there's going to be a stepper motor inside this watch, which drives the actual gearing mechanism. Let's take it apart, uh, find the integrated circuit inside of it, and uh, take a look at the silicon die and the circuitry it contains. This is, the watch is pretty small, so doing a live video is quite difficult. So what I'll do is I'll take a series of photographs with uh, my macro photography jig, and then we'll uh, look at each photograph as I disassemble the watch. So here we have the watch with the back removed and of course the battery sitting there highlighted in red. And then just to the left of it, that gold uh, screw is a uh, variable capacitor. This watch has the ability to be slightly tuned up and down in terms of its frequency if you want to adjust it exactly to the uh, uh, real time. Above that there's a little piece of green plastic. Now we can't quite make it out here in this photograph so if I throw it into my photo editor and do some post-processing I can uh, bring up the text. Uh, it tells me two really interesting things. First of all, it tells me the watch was made in West Germany. Uh, now, West Germany reunited in uh, 1990, so gives me an indication we're looking at a design probably around 30, maybe 35 years old. Uh, below that, some interesting text. One jewel. Uh, mechanical watches use synthetic rubies uh, to provide a low friction element for the bearing surfaces. Uh, before quartz watches came along, generally speaking, the more jewels a watch had, the higher quality it was because it meant more and more of it had these low friction points, which of course cost money. And then eventually uh, duties were level, leveled on watches and uh, the more jewels you had, generally you have to pay more uh, import duty. Those laws still, of course, exist probably until this day. And of course, you, very common to see watches marked. Um, even sometimes you have to mark down no jewels, but this one's one jewel. Let's uh, zoom back out to the watch. I've now removed that piece of uh, green plastic and I've removed the battery. You can see, of course, a coil and, and that's the uh, stator of a, a stepper motor. So. What happens is the uh, assembly drives a current through the motor, and that's going to cause a, a, a bearing. To, uh, it's going to cause a gear to, of course, rotate uh, back and forth. And if we just uh, look a little bit below that, we can see a slightly purplish thing. That's the uh, synthetic ruby, uh, which is providing the pivot point for this little tiny gear here. So, and that seems to be really typical. Every watch I've ever torn down seems to have this arrangement. Let's go to the little tiny circuit board, and we've extracted it here. And now we're looking at it on the other direction, so the uh, little golden set screw is on one side, but now what we're seeing is the uh, rest of that variable capacitor on this side here. You can see a little black blob that holds the integrated circuit. We're going to take that plastic off in a moment and uh, study the semiconductor. And then the silver canister is the, the watch crystal, uh, very much designed exactly for watch purposes. So, uh, And that's about it for components. So here's the whole silicon die once you remove it from that black epoxy blob. And to sort down what we're looking at, let's uh, look at the uh, block diagram. We know for certain there must be an oscillator on this assembly because we have that crystal there, and just by the nature of what it is. Now the crystal will have a very special frequency, and uh, it's uh, 32 kilohertz nominally, but more exactly uh, 32,768 hertz, which looks like a fairly strange number, but that's exactly 2 to the 15th. Um, that's important because basically if you put uh, this crystal through a divider that divides uh, uh, by a 15 um, to the 15th, you'll get a 1 hertz uh, output, of course, which is just excellent for driving uh, the second hand. Uh, now, of course, uh, the other thing you're going to find is, is a driver here. You'll have to increase the ability to, uh, this signal here will have to become strong enough to drive uh, a motor uh, that we saw uh, in the assembly. And I uh, want to imagine that uh, both leads come in here. So we should be able to find an oscillator circuit somewhere in the silicon die. We should be able to find a binary counter. And uh, we should be able to find some drivers. So let's go back to the silicon die and see if we can sort down those major blocks. So I've printed the whole die out. And let's just get uh, oriented here. The middle section here looks like digital logic. There's sort of an analogish feel down here. And I'll explain why in a, in a moment. And up here, definitely some power transistors. You see this, these squiggles are the gates, basically. What's going on here is if you look at a, a power transistor, uh, a FET always has this boundary at the uh, gate here. And of course, you only, it's only really the interface here where you can carry electrons across. And if you build a power transistor, what you want to do is start increasing that area to get more and more. And you can see they've gone to an extreme here where they start uh, zigzagging the gate around to create as much possible area as they can. It's always a real great sign that you're looking at a power transistor. Uh, now let's see here. We have one transistor here. One transistor here, of course. And you might think there's just one transistor in here. But if you start sketching down on the metal layer, 
you can see that there's a couple fingers here that go off into this direction here. You get a couple fingers going off in this direction here. And then uh, you can sort of see now that you got the common substrate here. Basically, we have one gate here and one gate here. Uh, you got four pads. And these here uh, almost certainly are diodes. And uh, I think what we're looking at is known as an H bridge. You have uh, two driver transistors on one side that can pull, pull up and down one side of the motor and two on this side here. And the reason for that is I think they can drive current in and out of the actual coil. And they do it in both directions so they can cause that little... Uh, stepper gear to go back and forth. Okay, that's the power transistors. Now if we come down here, we're going to find the divider. We said it's about 15 bits long. You can start seeing a repeating pattern showing up here. Um, and it comes over here, and there's another repeat here. And if you count closely, uh, you can sort of suspect that this is probably a D flip-flops worth of logic. So it's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So it's the 6 bits here, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 bits here. 13, 14, 15 bits here. So it looks like they got to divide by three. And then for uh, reasons that actually aren't that clear to me, you can see it sort of steps down. I don't know if they just had a layout uh, sizing problem or whatever, but I kind of thought they'd be all across. But uh, this is basically the binary divider. That leaves some logic up here. This is driving towards the transistor. I don't think this is a ripple counter. And a ripple counter, if you do a, a bunch of D flip-flops in a row, uh, you can cause something called a, a ripple counter. You basically put a D flip-flop. It's got a Q and a Q bar. And what you can do is um, move the Q bar up and you have the common clocking. This is now a 2-bit counter. And uh, the ripple counter is just a bunch of series of D flip-flops. Um, so they tend to uh, ripple, of course, down. Uh, but uh, I think what's happening here is actually there's some carry logic here. So this is a true digital um, a counter with uh, the carry up here. So it actually all the bits change at once. And uh, let's see here. We have clearly a large capacitor here uh, that's associated with the motor driver controller, so something going on there. Down here, uh, either, either power distribution or again, I think it's a larger uh, a capacitor. You can see the diodes here. Uh, you can see a resistor here. Tends, tends to make you think this is probably the actual uh, oscillator which drives the actual crystal. Um, that leaves a couple functions over here um, in this area around here. And uh, to sort those down, of course, what you can do is actually uh, enlarge the photographs and you get a, a better sense of what you're looking at. Um, here's that section here, just uh, uh, drawn large. And what you can, of course, now see is we can see the metal, uh, obviously, in, in the brighter color. Uh, you can then see the uh, polysilicon uh, coming down. So I can sketch out of one that's a little more obvious. It sort of sketches around here. And then you, of course, see the actual uh, the vias, uh, where the metal connects downwards into another layer. So probably two two metal layer process, I suspect. And what you can do is actually you can start keep on doing this. You can then uh, analyze uh, the actual uh, gates down uh, to, a, to a gate level. So uh, there we go. Th that's basically what's inside a, a digital watch and uh, the technology contained. Uh, really interesting. Uh, at these kind of 1980 design nodes, you can definitely... Uh, analyze down to the transistor level uh, fairly easily. As always, if you want to take a look at the actual uh, photograph in high resolution, I keep a copy on my blog, electronupdate.blogspot.com, and you can uh, take a look at this photograph here, uh, and then I have a copy of the photograph here where I start to uh, be able to trace down at the uh, transistor level. So I'd mentioned about synthetic rubies, and this is a little piece that holds the, the one jewel in this watch. Let me put this onto a slide. I'll take it under the microscope and uh, Let's take a look at that uh, nice uh, ruby and uh, see how it looks. So I just have it on the microscope here. I'm capturing a live video. Let me just see if I can scoot down to the actual ruby. You can see it's slightly different in colored. And I will center it here. And I'm going to change my objective to a slightly higher magnification so we can get a better uh, look at it here. Now once you get it focused, you can actually see the metal around the actual ruby. It looks very rough now because uh, it was very smooth in the... Uh, by the naked eye becomes very very clearly quite rough but the ruby itself of course uh, beautifully smooth and uh, you get this field depth problem now so I'm just adjusting the microscope up and down so I can sort of see the uh, the barrel uh, normally you'd stack these photographs if you want to create a nice uh, 3d view of the actual uh, ruby but was, the rubies are basically what provides a mechanical watch uh, low friction uh, pivot points and uh, 
in the era of mechanical watches, they were all over, and uh, as the industry transitioned to quartz watches, it's now not too hard to find a watch which has uh, no rubies at all. In terms of process, one really helpful program is GIMP. It's a, a photo editor, and uh, it has built into it a real helpful um, capability to tease out colors and uh, make that very easy to see. So here we have the zoomed in portion here, and of course we can see the metal, and then we can see polysilicon, but sometimes it's not super obvious. Now you can go into the color tool and uh, adjust what they call the curve, and when you uh, drag it down or up, you can actually really start to creating false colors, which starts to really highlight uh, the behaviors. This is also how I changed that to green plastic so I could read the lettering. So uh, if you ever do analysis, you're taking photographs, and uh, you basically have two colors which are really close to each other, uh, GIMP can really start teasing out the differences and they get this uh, a very clear uh, pattern from the actual photograph.